HD Smartcast. You are listening to an HD Smartcast original. एक मिनट रुक जाओ रेडी होने दो चलो ये कर लेते हैं भी एक ग्रेट इंट्रो हाय आई एम अक्षय हाय दिस इज सौरभ एंड यू आर लिसनिंग टू द फाउंडर थीसिस पॉडकास्ट वी मीट सम ऑफ द मोस्ट सेलिब्रेटेड सार्ट ऑफ फाउंडर इन द कंट्री एंड वी वॉन्ट टू लर्न हाउ टू बिल्ड द यूनिकॉर्न I'm I'm Hemant Kanoria. I'm the chairman of uh, Shrey Infrastructure Finance Limited. Start them young to teach them better is the motto of most Indian Marwari business families, and that is exactly what Hemant Kanoria's father had in mind when he entrusted him with the responsibility of reviving. two sick flour mills at the age of 18 when he was growing up in kolkata in today's episode of founder thesis akshay dat talks to hemant kanoria and they discuss how he took the business ahead and turned it into shrey infrastructure finance limited which has assets worth around 6 billion us dollars today so it was a very difficult time because uh, turning around two sweet units we were successful in doing so and but at the same time the government policies changed and because of the change of the government policies all the flour mills in west bengal came to uh, to almost a close down and we had to also close down these two flour mills we had our family had the largest flour mill in asia that particular time bengal flour mill so what happened what changed the government policy So the government decided that uh, the flour mills they were being allocated wheat, which was a raw material that they would not be allowed. Uh, they had to buy it in the open market, and they would not be given any allocation. And at the same time, they introduced tax on the on the final finished products, which was flour and all the others. So because of that, the whole market changed because we had to bring in wheat because West Bengal is not a wheat growing area. So we had to bring wheat from Haryana and Punjab. and we used to bring it in rakes because it was essential commodity so on the way any of the government departments could uh, stall the rake at the train and take over the week and then compensate oh, okay. later on so therefore you know it was like a chaotic kind of a condition because of the government policies and then it was a discouragement for people to have a production plant in west bengal because uh, there were taxes which were imposed on the finished product but there, there was no tax on the raw material so therefore it made it uh, it created a huge non competitive uh, advantage there was no advantage it was a disadvantage for all the companies and therefore the smaller mid size mills had to close down immediately the larger ones also they struggled because they required huge quantity of raw material which they were not able to procure or get so over a period of time the entire face of the flour mills in west bengal changed and our family was having the largest flour mill which was set up by the britishers in 1830 so therefore that also had to it was a blue chip company it was a listed company but you know everything had to come to a close down and this happened by the time all the flour mills were closing down it was 87 88 so about 6 years of my life i was engaged in the family business of the flour mills and all the animal feed plant trading businesses etc so that's how i spent my time learning the art of uh, the business okay so how old were you when uh, the mills had to be shut down i was about uh, 24 25 okay so then what did you uh, decide to do next like so, this is obviously the genesis of sri but i just want to hear from you like how that actually happened so then we tried our hands in a lot of things because shrey also stands for uh, we uh, floated this company which was known as shri radha krishna export industries so if you see the abbreviations it stands for shrey but actually it was shri radha krishna export industries because we started dabbling in exports of uh, of uh, leather goods of uh, handkerchiefs of you know of various things and we were, we also set up a cigarette filter plant for exporting so we tried that unfortunately those did not work out well 
And uh, so therefore, you know, there were a lot of uh, failures in my early days in life, so which was good because it taught me a lot of lessons, what to do and what not to do. And uh, then my one of my younger what brothers. What were some of the lessons that you 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 know that served you well throughout, like that you learnt in that phase of experimentation? See, one thing which was there is that never give up, because see, the opportunities will always be there in adversity. But because of some adversity has happened, so that does not mean. So it was a solution orientation which was there, because when you take over two farms, one being closed and one sick, so you start thinking from the beginning. Or on solutions and not on problems because problems are already there. So you have to find out solutions, and therefore the genesis of Shree also happened because infrastructure in the late 80s and beginning of 90 infrastructure in India was was in shambles. Whether we look at power plant because Calcutta especially had a lot of potholes, it had a lot of uh, load shedding, and that is how we grew up. So therefore the infrastructure was in shambles. and also the liquidity for the country that time was a problem because india had to pawn the gold to raise money less the gold so therefore you know it was basically we had both these two crises and uh, that is why i thought that there would be an opportunity me and my younger brother sunil and at the guide is my father so we thought about it that what we should be doing we said okay finance is a problem for the country infrastructure is a problem so therefore there would be definitely opportunities because in all both these two areas were problematic so we started financing infrastructure so as finance was a problem in infrastructure so we got into financing and infrastructure so that's how the uh, the uh, shree started the genesis of shree and then we did our first ipo in 1990 so uh, b- before yeah. before we reach the ipo so when you started i, I want to uh, Understand more about that time. So, you were financing infrastructure. Where was the money coming from? Was it your own family money, or was it uh, like you borrowed from banks to lend it out further? Yeah. So our first line of credit, which we got from the bank, was about five lakhs of rupees. So you can just imagine that you know in eighty nine when you start a company, you get a five lakh of rupees as a limit. You have your own capital of. 25% of that, so that is how with uh, very modest means Shree was started because we didn't know how this business was, would be doing. We had no idea as a family about financing. We had no idea as a family about infrastructure. Infrastructure had not opened up that time, so therefore we started financing with construction equipments to contractors, and that is why how we got in touch with uh, LNT, Larsen and Tubro was manufacturing construction equipment, the mining equipment. Which they were not able to sell because the s- total sales of construction mining equipment in eighty nine used to be just about hundred crore per annum, which peaked to about thirty thousand crore about four five years back per annum. So therefore, that is where we have seen the journey, and so we were a part of the journey with. Uh, so with the manufacturer, we used to go to also help them in the sales, go to the contractors and convince them that buying equipment will help them to improve their efficiency. Cut down their construction time, and uh, their payback used to be about a year. So, if a if a contractor bought an equipment, he was able to pay back the interest and the installments uh, again and the principal within just one year. So that was the payback. So that's how we introduced the mechanization into the construction and mining field along with the manufacturing, and uh, then infrastructure started opening up subsequently. How did you get your very first deal? Like you know, the first financing that you did, like how did that come about? So basically, the first financing was in collaboration with, uh, as I mentioned, that Larsen and Tubro was the company that we tied up, and with the regional manager here, they were also trying to find out how to improve their sales, and we were also trying. But to- how did Larsen and Tubro know about you? Because you were till then like an unknown. Entity. No, because I knew the I re- knew the person concerned here, so you know. Through the contacts, etc., with chambers of commerce and all, so therefore we had just uh, met with each other and we became friends. And he was trying to sort out our problem. We were trying to find solutions to the problems. So therefore, as I mentioned, that you know the whole approach from life, from the beginning of my career in business, has been solution orientation. That if there is a problem, there is a solution which is embedded in that problem. So always look at the solution and not the problem. So uh, 
how did the uh, business grow from the, the five lakh line of credit which you started by the time you reached to ipo stage like how much were you uh, was on your loan books like the total amount and you know if you can share that journey of uh, building it up so i think that that time we what we were adding was in lakhs it was not in crores because the times were also different it is not uh, we are not talking about today's times where everything is in uh, billions of dollars it to be not even touching billions so doing your first million itself was a herculean task and billions were just unimaginable at that particular time so therefore and you know there was nothing to lose because uh, i was young i was about 26 or so so therefore there was a lot to do in life and uh, because it's the first few years of 7 8 years of being in the flower milling businesses and other businesses which was initially it started off with difficult times then it became successful then again it was a failure because of the circumstances and the government policies changing so it was good because it was the up and down so the usual business roller coaster ride i was able to see it in a very short in a way you lost your fear of failure very early on because you saw it up close pretty early yeah so i would not say failure i would say that i had my first roller coaster ride quite early in life in business so therefore you know you never you when you go on a roller coaster ride you don't uh, you enjoy both going up and coming down so the entire mindset changes and that's fortunately the mindset i had uh, had a change in my mindset too that that's how you look at businesses and uh, that's why we started off with uh, shrey and it was about uh, you know first we got from the bank then again we were able to increase the business next year we got a line of 25 lakhs then again it increased so the, it was a gradual progress in the initial days till the time that in 1990 89 90 everyone was coming from uh, for an ipo so we also thought that you know let's do an ipo so we got many of the investment bankers to get convinced on our idea and we did a princely sum in 1990 of 1 crore 80 lakhs for our ipo and that was again quite a you know uh, quite an experience because to raise 1 crore 80 lakhs i had to have all the usual brokers meetings and uh, press meetings investment bankers so we have the, we had the best of investment bankers with us and uh, we did our road show starting from surat to baroda to amdabad jaipur chennai calcutta mumbai delhi everywhere so therefore you know just to raise one crore sometimes when i just look back and think about the journey which i made to raise that one crore 80 lakhs was quite an interesting journey now people will just you know for one crore 80 lakhs they will just back their eyes lid and the money will just go in <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, the way that we went about and uh, then we were so in how, what was your like uh, size before the ipo like you know that what crore 80 lakhs increased your asset size by how much like did you like double it with that yeah, all, yes it's almost doubled it okay <laughs> and then we came out with the rights issue hmm. again in 92 then again so, we had a follow on issue so you know then continuously we kept on because once we had gone into the market then we we had got used to understanding how the market uh, would behave and if we if we had a good uh, proposition then the market would definitely contribute to that and uh, for the last 30 years we have seen very very many ups and downs so it's not been just every time up but as i said that you know it's a roller coaster ride so you enjoy while you are going up you also enjoy the thrill when you are coming down because again you have to go up it's a roller coaster so it's so uh, and the lending business also started getting diversified uh, uh, tell me about that journey also like how you diversified beyond just lending for equipment so what happened was that as we were growing in 95 we got the first development financial institution the german government to come in and extend a line of credit to us because they thought us to be a unique unique platform where we were lending as a private sector company lending to the infrastructure and we were not only lending to the medium or large projects at that time because we had not started lending to the medium and large projects we had only been lending to the enablers 
which were the construction companies and the contractors. Because if they did not, if they were not enabled to execute the work properly, then all the projects would not have happened. So we were absolutely at the ground level with these contractors and construction companies, and we had devised ways of assessing their risks and working with them as a financial partner instead of just being a financial bank because that model would not have worked out because many of the companies, they did not even have a balance sheet. I remember my first instance that because we hired a couple of bankers in our company because we wanted to do all the assessment, etc. So we had one gentleman from a public sector bank. We had another gentleman from a, from a multinational bank who had joined in our team and their evaluations would have resulted in doing no business. So we had to find out a unique method of understanding because the first time when we wanted a contractor to bring his balance sheet, so show us a balance sheet. So he brought his chartered accountant. And uh, so I was quite amazed that, you know, what would I be doing the chartered account with the chartered accountant? And he told me that, please tell him what kind of a balance sheet that you require and he will make it and give it to you. <laughs> 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 because you know the concept for a contractor to have a balance sheet and everything should be structured because they used to hire manual uh, you know, usually the contractors that time were known as uh, thekedar and uh, thekedar right so thekedar you know you don't have the thekedar coming with a balance sheet and all so he thought that uh, it was uh, like a all cash business and yeah yeah so he thought because he had to give all the workers every day cash or every week cash so therefore whatever money that he got from the principal he had to convert it into cash because he could distribute it he had to buy all the materials in cash and there were no machines that time so we were introducing him to machines which was uh, at the end of the day improving his efficiency and also the productivity so therefore from that particular perspective it was a new world for him it was a new world for us so we had to invent that how do we make the assessment in a proper manner of the credit and the risks that we were taking so therefore it was a different world altogether and we then so how were you different from a bank like what was your assessment methodology that that was unique to you so it was very simple. So what we used to look at was that, uh, you know, the key elements for us was a track record of that person, that what he was doing, which area was he operating in, who was the principal, what was his capability to complete the project. And also that if he bought these equipments, A, B, C, D equipments, with those equipments, how his efficiency will improve and how much of more contribution that he would have that he can be, he can be increase his profit. At the same time, he would be in a position to pay back our interest and the, the installments which was there. So these were very practical on the ground assessment which had to be done. And we had to even travel along with him to his sites to see it, whether it be a mining site or it be a site. So you know, whether we had to travel in buses or we had to travel because many of the places, the trains did not go. So you go on a train journey, then you take a bus and you will reach that particular site. You see how it was working. And if he, if he puts in equipment that what is the augmentation of his cash flow? So, and who was the principal? So whether the principal had the capability to pay or not and the intent, intent to pay. And the contractor also, whether he had the capability to pay that was one which was done through an assessment, but his intent to pay, because if his intent was not there to pay. So therefore, you know, whatever you may have done on the balance sheet assessment, it could have all been futile. So these were the practical kind of things that we were basically making an assessment on. And gradually, we put that into our system for assessment. So we institutionalized the entire organization by putting in whatever our learnings was, were there, we put it into documents and then when the teams came in, the professionals, when they joined in, they were all trained to make the assessment in that particular way. So you like first learnt it firsthand and then created a process around it, which then you were able to hire people to follow the process and yeah. scale it up. Hmm. Interesting. So you were telling me about your diversification and how DEG funded you at a time when you were mostly working with contractors. So uh, what happened at that stage? So in 1995, when DEG came in, after that in 96, 97, we got FMO, which was the Dutch government's organization. Then IFC Washington came in. And they also took equity in our company. And when they came in, so then they introduced 
us into financing on infrastructure. So how to go about assessing infrastructure, financing them, and uh, because then uh, both, both these two institutions, uh, both these, all the three institutions, that is the BG, FMO, and IFC, they trained us and our teams to make assessment of infrastructure projects and to finance. And that's how we diversified into financing of infrastructure projects. And India was also opening up 94, 95 onwards. A lot of private sector investments were encouraged by the government in uh, infrastructure projects. So we did our first power plant, which was a barge mounted power plant and another power plant in Odisha. Then we did our first road project, which was in Andhra Pradesh. And uh, we did first our first bridge project. So therefore, that's how we got, uh, and these were the first projects which was done under public-private partnerships in India. We did all the four airports financing. Okay, so all of these projects, you were the financing partner for somebody who was executing it. Yes, yes, yes. So we came in as a financier, so as an institution. So besides the banks and all who were financing, but we were doing these financing as a private sector infrastructure uh, company. So, uh, and then you uh, further diversified into solar also, like uh, uh, from financing, uh, I think you got into the solar energy business. Uh, like, why did you decide to go beyond just financing? Yeah, so we were the first company in 2000 to introduce the uh, government, the International World Bank's program of uh, PVMTI, which is known as a photovoltaic market transformation initiative. So we worked with the Global Environment Facility and the World Bank, and we introduced this particular project in Sundarban, where we started financing solar uh, systems, solar water systems, solar lights, solar fans, because in the villages there were no electricity. So this is what was introduced by us into financing of that. So we basically we came in as a financial partner and we enabled various constituents to be in a position to develop a business model where they could make money and at the same time it would serve the need of the people and because they were able to the constituents were able to earn money so they were able to take the loans and repay us and that has been our model because uh, you know when you develop certain areas and that particular time everyone is very new and our diversification also basically has primarily been, it's not diversification because then we started also making equity investment because when the IFC as an institution, they were, they also had put their chief credit officer on our board because when they were introducing us to financing, then they said that, you know, you should not be only taking debt, but you should also be putting in equity. So you have better control on the company in case there's a problem. And also you de risk yourself because in debt your returns are uh, limited but therefore in some of the companies things will not work out in the manner that you have wanted it to so therefore it will be compensated through the equity investments and the equity returns so therefore we created funds and uh, which then took equity and because again as i said that it was very new so we had to also in many of the cases put operational teams because if the operational teams were not working with the promoters, then we would have had no knowledge about it. So in the last 30 years, I think it's been a great learning journey. There is nothing which should be done or should not be done because every, even, everything has to be evaluated at a particular moment of time. And whatever is appropriate at that time needs to be done. So uh, around this time, uh, how big had you become? You know, when uh, IFC encouraged you to take equity ownership also in projects like uh, what was like say the headcount of the company or uh, some idea if you can give me so i think that we were not very many that time must must have been about we had some few branches we were about uh, 100 people and uh, the size of the company was also about 100 150 crore then gradually you see the company has also grown over a period of time and if you ask me that when we started our journey in 89 that the company would reach at this particular size, we had not imagined. So we were just embarked on a journey, like life. So you are on a journey and you don't know where life is taking. You just have an open mind. You think positive. You look at the opportunities which are coming in. Evaluate the opportunities at that particular time. 
and see that whether it makes sense to uh, capitalize on that opportunity or you just let it pass by. And what many, many times you see that something is coming as an opportunity. But then after that, that opportunity may become a problem. So then you have to deal with that problem. Right, right, right. So uh, I, I want to understand the journey from uh, like, you know, uh, a handful of employees to 100, 150 employees, you know, and this is at a time when there were no digital tools. Like, you know, today, uh, entrepreneurs and founders have access to a lot of digital tools to manage teams and so on. But, you know, h- how did you build up this team of 150 people and with, who were in different locations also? Like, like how was that journey like? See, basically to recollect it, just, it was, as I said, that it was just a journey which was just happening. It was an Mm -hmm. unfolding of Mm -hmm. a book. So, you know, as you keep on unfolding the book, the book becomes more interesting. So then we had thousands of people joining in. We had almost, Mm -hmm. what, 100 branches now. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people working all over the country. If you look at thousands of people working inside the entire group, which are Mm -hmm. there. So from, you know, from few numbers, from double digit, it becomes triple digit, then it becomes four digits and five digits and it just keeps on happening. You don't have to, and it's all effortless because once you are building up an institution and if you are mm. taking the right steps, then it just keeps on growing and more and mm. more people keep on joining in and more and more people. So you just have to create an enabling environment. And also, so, uh, I want to understand, like you said, if you just keep taking the right steps, it keeps growing. So what were those right steps you took to, you know, become from double digit to triple digit to four digits, five digits? Like, uh, what were your learnings on building an organization? So I think that one thing which was very important for us was to be doing the right things. The right things means that you keep on reviewing what we do. So when we were in the equipment financing business, first we were doing equipments which was for road construction. Then we did for irrigation projects. More and more road construction equipments came in. So therefore we evaluated and saw that whether those would be required on the ground or not. We tied up with various manufacturers all over the world who brought them into India. First it was all import of the equipments which was taking place. Then we encouraged them to set up their plants in India. So now most of the manufacturers who are manufacturing construction, mining equipment, self-care equipment, they have their manufacturing plants in India and they are not importing. Their import component has come down to maybe from anywhere from 0 to 15%. But earlier it used to be almost 100%. So we have seen this entire journey. And we used to get lines of credit from overseas institutions and also the export credit agencies to promote these kind of businesses also. So therefore, when we are doing, when we were doing the financing, so we have seen all these particular, uh, you know, in our entire journey of 30 years, we have seen all these particular elements that how the market has developed, how we have been able to contribute, how we have worked along with the, uh, along with the equipment manufacturers, with the customers, and with the infrastructure players. Some would be like where you took right decisions, but eventually it would have been your people doing the right things. And, you know, how did you create that kind of a institution where everyone takes the right decisions and everyone is uh, contributing positively? And, uh, you know, I mean, one of the biggest challenges for companies is, I think, this only, like how to build, how, how to manage people and build up uh, that team of people who are, uh, your biggest assets, possibly. So, you, you know, that's something I wanted to uh, understand from you. I think that in any organization, people are the biggest assets. So, what we have always focused on is that when we are getting people, getting good professional means that people who have the understanding of that particular... I'm not saying that we have not gone wrong. We have made, you know, millions of mistakes in the last 30 years of Shrey also. Millions of mistakes. And in hindsight, if you look at it and see that if I had not done this, you know, I would have been better off. If I had not taken this person, I would have been better off. If I had not done this business, I would have been better off. If I had not made this investment or given this loan, I would have been better off. But but in hindsight, everyone becomes wiser. At that particular time when you make mistakes, then how do you 
what we have always tried to do is that whenever we have made mistakes, we have tried to see that how do we put it in the institutional memory. So therefore, the next person does not make the same mistake. The next person may make a new mistake, which will again go to the institutional memory. But you know, you have the luxury of, that's what we keep on telling our people, that you have the luxury of making mistakes. First, quickly learn from there and see that whether that mistake was made in the past or not. If that mistake was made in the past, that means that you have not tried to learn from what the mistake the institution has made in the past. And if you have made a mistake that you have not tried to learn from the mistake which has been made and correct it and move forward. The biggest advantage for an organization is when they are working as a team, then as they say to err is human. But if there are 10 people who are taking a decision together, then the chances of making mistake reduces. Because then 10 people, people would have put in 5 persons, 10 persons, 20 persons, they would have put in their brains together. So therefore, one person can err, but all the 20 would be making a mistake in the same thing that there, may, there is a catastrophe in store then for the organization. Okay. So if I can summarize some of the learnings, one, you are, I think, strongly in favor of collective decision making so that quality of decisions improves and then you give freedom to people to make mistakes and third thing is you try and build an institutional memory uh, or uh, an institutional learning from mistakes that were made uh, so that the whole organization learns from it yeah because the institutionalization of uh, any of the processes and all is very important because as we keep on saying that humans are mortals so you know all of us here to die but an organization can live for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years. And why an organization can live? Because more and more people keep on coming in. But if you have created an institution, so an institution will last beyond the lives of an individual. So therefore, we do not believe that, you know, personally, if I have done something, that maybe that I may have started this particular idea. But that does not mean and my brother and my family may have started. But today... Today is so large that just if we claim that, you know, we can do everything or we do everything, it will be foolhardy on our part because we are also part of the system now. So when you create a system, you have to become a part of that particular system. We trust people. So our trust with our clients, our trust with our people is 100%. We don't believe in 99.99% trust. So we believe in 100% trust. And if someone makes a mistake, it is uh, tolerable. We'll make the uh, correction and move forward. But if someone has tried to do something which is not correct for the organization, then we are also very strict in meeting out the necessary punishment. Because as I said, that we believe in 100% trust because I think that it is very important to build up an organization on, the, on a very strong fabric of trust and a country also. So today, if you look at it, that what is the biggest problem in our country and many of the countries because the trust element is missing. So the fabric has got weakened. So I think that it is important that an organization or a country builds up a very strong fabric of trust. Unless, you know, someone, when you build up a fabric of trust, you have to understand that 99% of the people will follow that, maybe 1% may be errant. But you don't make, for that 99% people, you don't make the rule which is applicable to that 1% errant people. It should be the other way around. So that's what we have tried to uh, indoctrine in our company. Mm, that's very interesting. Okay. So uh, coming back to the journey. So early 2000s, you got into financing large projects, taking equity stakes. So, so tell me about the journey from there on. So basically, that was an interesting one because, uh, you know, we had not never taken equity stake. And also when we started first for taking equity stake, we did not put in management teams there. So we just, uh, you know, thought that uh, the client will be in a position. But the client, we so our mistake was we did not understand for the client also, it was something which was new. Because, uh, so they would also make mistakes. And uh, therefore, and many times what happens is that the clients also make mistakes because they may have been caught up by their whims and fancies and not be going through a proper process of evaluation. And uh, so we made our mistakes also. Then we invested in a telecom tower business, so which we were able to be on telecom, so which became the largest telecom tower company in the world in seven years' time, and we disinvested. And we also learned the art of uh, investments and disinvestments at an appropriate time, exiting. 
but I would not say that again. So the learning has been that many of the investments we have, we have been able to exit at the right time. Many of the investments we have not been. We have uh, tried to exit at the right time in many of the loans which we have given, but we have not been successful. So therefore, you know, I would say that it is a mixed bag. If I say and claim that uh, you know, in every 100% of the cases we have been successful, that would be wrong. And uh, in the last 30 years, because the economy has gone through its ups and downs, its challenges, so we have also been a witness, not only a witness to that challenge, but we have also borne the brunt of that challenge. So some we have been able to, uh, out of some challenges, we have been able to emerge without any bruises. Some there have been some bruises, some there have been some burns. In some cases, there would be small surgery also. So, but that's been a part of uh, the journey. So, what is your uh, decision-making framework on when to invest and when to exit? You know, how do you think about it uh, and make that decision? You know, how do you reach to that decision that it's uh, it's time to invest or it's time to exit? So, basically, it's a process again. So, therefore, let us suppose that if we go sector-wise, state-wise, because India is not a country, it's a continent. So, therefore, each state is different. It's almost like Europe. So, when we are investing in one state, one state may be, some state may be like Greece, another may be like Germany. So, in Europe. So, you don't have the same principles when you are investing in Germany, in Greece, because then, you know, someone will, will take everything away. When you invest in Greece, you invest with a different mindset. When you invest in Germany, then you invest in a different mindset. So, the different mindset. So similarly, when we are investing or financing in any of the states or with the government policies, etc., we have to keep in mind that the government policies may change, state governments, political parties may change. They may have their uh, viewpoints, which may be totally different when the new government comes in. So, And being in infrastructure, we are exposed to all these vagaries, like the vagaries of nature. So we are exposed to the vagaries of the political systems, to the government changes, to the various kind of people who come in. So it is a very sensitive sector which people don't realize. Yeah, yeah. So that has been the learning for us. So, you know, there's nothing I would say today is, uh, so the, the, as you are asking that what is the framework that we have for decision making. So the decision making framework is, Basically, we do it through a collective mechanism. So, therefore, there is one particular person who takes a decision. It may have been initiated by one person, definitely. It has because the initiation has to start somewhere. But then there are different levels where the decisions have to be, the people have to give their inputs. And finally, it will go to our committees where the decision will be taken. So there are people who have, uh, who understand those businesses. Some people may understand different other perspectives of the business. Someone may understand that infrastructure sector itself. Someone may understand the financials in the infrastructure sector. Someone may understand the risks of that particular sector of that particular business. So it's a combined, it's a collective decision-making process. So there everyone's inputs are taken into account. And then a decision is finally made. Huh, sure, sir. So uh, you have seen uh, a, a lot of these, uh, the term you use as vagaries of nature, you know, like large external events which affect countries, economies, uh, the entire world, uh, you know, say 9-11, uh, the Lehman crash, uh, the, the current uh, COVID pandemic, uh, even the liberalization uh, in the 90s in India. So, you know, uh, what was your way of dealing with these uh, large events? See, every time there has been some way or the other that, you know, we have been able to find out solutions to those particular problems with the uh, either working along with the government or working along with the institutions, the bankers, our clients. And that is how we have been able to you know, steer through all these storms in the past. Now also that we are going through the storm of the pandemic, and especially last two years for infrastructure financing companies, it has been very difficult because of the ILFS uh, episode which took place in 2018. So the confidence of the investors, the confidence of the bankers and the financial institutions in infrastructure financing companies have 
substantially reduced because we have seen the problem with IDFC, we have seen the problem with ILFS. So therefore, the confidence level is very low at this particular juncture. And there has also been a mindset change on the government because earlier the government had a... And I'm not saying that it is wrong or right because uh, you know, every government has the way of their own thinking, which is always uh, because they also have their own processes, they have their own collective wisdom, which is there. So every government takes their own decisions that what should be their policies at that particular time. So at this particular time, the government policy is that, you know, the private sector should be in a position to fend for themselves and find out solutions. So they should not be relying on the government. So they should actually become Atmanirbhar. So therefore, that is a policy. So it's fine. You know, so for in this particular time, what happens is that many of the companies may take a little longer time to be in a position to steer through these issues because many are government-related issues only. And especially in the infrastructure sector, if there's a problem, it is usually related to the government because the counterparty in a public-private partnership in infrastructure, as they say, public-private partnership, the counterparty is always the government. So by, you know, the government does not mean that government in the sense that it has to be a state or a central government, but if it is to do with the public, it is the uh, it is basically also becomes the responsibility of the government to give you an example let's suppose that someone has a road so a road concession company has some problem with uh, the government that they have either not got their payments or there has been a change in the policy so who gets affected the public at large because if they are not able to maintain that road then people who are traveling on that road because the road concession company or the power generation company or the power distribution company they are basically involved and engaged in public service directly directly and not even indirectly because you know someone who is producing luxury goods it is only limited to some people who may be buying those luxury goods but if it is a road of power if it is port so it is to do with common man because everyone has to travel on these particular on a road or they need power they need uh, to uh, travel you know maybe in a train they need to travel in the in, uh, in a plane and they need to use the airport so therefore it is for public service so therefore government gets involved and that is where the collaboration on a public private partnership is very very important but uh, you know at this particular juncture the government thinking has been that the private sector needs to fend for themselves and find out their own solutions so therefore many of the companies many of the clients that we have financed they are trying to struggle through these particular issues because you know suddenly if you tell someone that you have to find out uh, all the solutions to your problem yourself and when you have another partner who is also uh, along with you involved in it and uh, the partner says that you have to find so it becomes difficult so many of the clients are finding this to be a difficult proposition but i'm sure that they will be in a position to find out solutions over a period of time sometimes the solution comes uh, at the right time, sometimes the solution takes a little longer time. So, but the solutions always for any problem is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, like uh, 9 11 and Lehman crash, uh, like were these significant events for you? Like, you know, did they have a significant impact? No, but you see that, yes, it the business, it did have, but at that particular time, there was a difference. Because, as I said, that, you know, every government has a different policy. That particular time during the uh, Lehman crisis, the government at that time had a policy that we are going to see that how we are in a position to support everyone in the financial sector. When there was, again, because we have not, these are the recent crises, but before that we have seen in early 90s the Harshad Mehta problem, then we saw the Chetan Parekh one, then we saw many of the scams in the NPFC sector in the mid-90s. So at that particular time, the approach was a little different than it is now. So, you know, every government will have a different approach. So I'm uh, not saying that anything is right or wrong because it is uh, basically the collective decision of the government at that particular time. So at this particular time, the government's policies are that, you know, the private sector, they have to find out their own solutions. The government cannot be coming in, uh, you know, uh, can, uh, cannot be coming and holding your hands every time. Can you tell me in the last decade, what has the journey been like? Like we've covered 
most of the 90s and the early 2000s uh, so you know what has been the uh, journey of stray in the last decade or so like you know in terms of diversification or uh, in terms of how the institution grew so what happened was that in 2008 before the lehman crisis we were fortunate just about 5 6 months before that we got into a joint venture with bnp paribas and our equipment finance company was was basically put into a separate vertical where bnp came in as a 50% partner so that was a big support at that particular time because by the support of bnp we were able to steer through the crisis of 2008 because BNP came in sometime in April 2008 and uh, September 2008 the Lehman crisis took place and then after that there was this support also that the government was able to offer to all the financial sector constituents so therefore there was a liquidity support also which came in and uh, we were able to steer through and grow and I think that from 2008 to 2018 it was almost like uh, you know, just a one-way growth, and that was you know every year we were growing by about uh, our disbursements were growing by it first year from 2009 to 10 it was about 60 percent, then 50 percent, 30, 35 percent year to year has been the growth. It started slowing down from 2014-15, and for infrastructure because we took a conscious decision in 2014 to reduce our infrastructure financing portfolio and focus only on the equipment financing side and after the as i mentioned the 2018 onwards after the ilfs crisis then both the growth of the infrastructure uh, financing and equipment financing has been slowed down because it was it has been more a period of consolidation of uh, exiting out of some of the sectors as i said that you know because we are in an area which is very much related to the government. So when our clients find difficulties in some of the areas, so it is also appropriate for us to exit out of those particular areas where the clients are finding it difficult. And uh, because as an institution, we don't want to get into a problem because uh, and complications. So that is why there has been a slowdown. And I think that this slowdown is going to continue for the next uh, couple of years where the business is there. So we are going through a consolidation phase where we are looking at that what businesses we should be in, what we should be exiting, which are the portfolios that we should downsell and exit out of. And that has been the exercise which has been going for the last two years and which I'm going, which I think will continue for another couple of years. So this period will be go more of uh, bringing in stability to the consolidation to the entire organization in the areas which are which we should be there in the future. Now I want to understand more about you as a person. You know, can you tell me like what is your daily routine? You know, how do you keep yourself uh, at the top of your game? See, basically, uh, personally, I am. Uh, you know, I love sports, so I have been almost in almost all the sports now over a period of time. With age, I've stabilized on a couple of things which I do on my daily routine. So, you know, I do my yoga, I do my pranayam, that is my daily routine, which brings in the calmness of uh, mind and also with the body. And uh, then either I would be doing, I, I play squash. So, few days in a week I play squash, some days I do running, some days I do gym. So, you know, I have, I have my yoga plus this so this is my daily routine which is there on the physical side of it so physical side about one to one and a half hours in the morning i like to spend with myself in uh, seeing that i'm fit and healthy then after that uh, you know i'm quite a relaxed kind of a person so therefore in the office etc also i like to look at things with a with a calm mind because uh, the position which uh, i've come into i have to also mentor a lot of uh, employees within the organization and I have to interact with the various uh, various uh, constituents who are there with that we need to deal with them so we have, a lot of networking is required to know what is happening in the world and also in the uh, in the uh, local market in India with the various state governments because our clients are working almost all over the country involved in infrastructure so you know 
interacting with them, knowing what is happening, where the policy changes will happen, giving the right kind of uh, directions and thoughts to the organization. But as I said, that we have a collection, collective decision-making process. So with our employees and with everyone, it is very clear that you know there is full empowerment and people are people are allowed to discuss and debate. So we don't encourage people to accept what the bosses tell them to accept, but we ask them to debate and discuss. Okay. Okay. And uh, how do you, uh, you know, when you're going through a tough phase, uh, how do you cope with it mentally? Like if, if there is a crisis happening which may threaten the future of the organization or, you know, those uh, like you may have made bad decisions and so on. So how do you uh, cope with that? I think that that is something which is, uh, you know, I have been tremendously fortunate that over a period of time, I have been able to calm my mind that when these ups and downs keep on coming in, I'm able to take it in a stride and uh, find, see through it with clear cut solutions, try to find out some places we are able to find out solutions, some places we are not. So my mind uh, right from the beginning has got trained into looking at solutions. So therefore, if a problem comes in, I don't find a problem to be insurmountable. And I find that a problem has a solution embedded inside it. So, you know, my mind will go to the solution. And that's the reason it doesn't get troubled. So, uh, you have played a role in uh, building more entrepreneurs through Sahaj. Uh, could you tell me about that? So, that's a, that has also been a very interesting experience because uh, this was an opportunity which came up in 2008 where the government decided to have these common service centers and only from the perspective that we thought that in the rural areas we can add some value that uh, we had embarked on that initiative and uh, which has resulted in building up about 80 90000 of entrepreneurs in the villages so it's a great satisfaction that you know because infrastructure is something where you don't build things for yourself because every road which is built by whoever whether it be the contractor or the concessionaire who is running it, they do it for the public good. So the satisfaction is that if you have done something, which is if you have done a good job, then people are happy with it. If you have done a shoddy job, then it will cause inconvenience to the persons. And it's a choice with the persons who are involved in it, who are building it, or facilitating that whole thing to happen, has to take place. So therefore, I think, uh, you know, this this was a business where I have been a facilitator, and then it is the teams which have done a great job of building up the whole organization. So how exactly does it operate? Like, uh, what all services does someone? Do? How do they sign up for it? And you know, yeah. So basically, at the ground level, what we people do is that uh, they are village level entrepreneurs who run these centers. So they are government services. They are uh, financial services, there are many other services, e-learning services, their banking, insurance, uh, e-learning services which are offered to the villages. Uh, then there is railway ticket booking which they do. So it is like a center. For every 10,000 villagers, there is one center which is run by an entrepreneur. And that entrepreneur may employ two, three people at his center. So it's both a brick and click model. And uh, so through that model, they are facilitating almost about 55 crore people in the villages. So, you know, you are uh, uh, like, there's a lot of humility in you in terms of uh, encouraging collective decision making, encouraging people to say no to you. Is that something which was like part of your nature or did you learn to be humble? Like, you know, how did this get developed? Because it seems to me like this is like a key uh, factor of uh, the way that Shrey has scaled up, you know, the, the humility which you have seems to be the reason. So, I mean, what do you think about no, I think that uh, humility only comes from the fact that, uh, you know, a person, when they know that they don't know anything, then you start becoming humble. So, you know, I always feel that there's so much to be known on this planet and we don't know. But were you like this when you were like 21? Like, you know, did you have that same level of humility or did it develop or did you like learn it over the years? So I think both because it is also dependent upon that how you grew up. So with my family also, whether it was my father, my grandfather 
all of them they taught us to respect everyone so you know the people who are working with us the respect for them that's why in our family we have people working in the fourth generation with us so the respect for people is very very important because there is no menial work which is there so the respect for people to learn from them because every small uh, a small person every you know everything on this planet teaches you something so like my grandfather used to tell me that you learn from a tree and it was a very simple learning that you know when you the tree bears fruits then it bends down with humility that people can pick up the fruit and when it has nothing then it is standing straight so you know if you know something then you will be humble if you don't know something then you will be standing uh, with pride so it's a small small yeah so it's a small small learning which is very important in life which has to be incorporated and put in in practice in life but do you find the current generation of entrepreneurs to have that same level of humility no i think it's a, it's see, it's a very personal thing some people because the way that they grow up they realize it some people they realize it over a period of time but you know either some few persons will realize at the age of 5 10 15 20 25 30 or when they are getting into this symmetry they realize that they have to be humble because they are getting getting gone <laughs> but life will have to bring in humility so either you do it willingly or unwillingly what is your uh, personal quest as of now you know like what is something which you are personally driven to do uh, either inside shrey or outside like you know more at a personal level so at a at a personal level no myself i think that's the journey which each one of us we are in right. parts of ever ending journey yeah so therefore the more that we know ourselves it is better and how we can contribute to whatever we do in touching lives of people whether it be in organization or otherwise that was mr hemant kanoria telling us how shrey was built to know more about the shrey infrastructure finance limited log on to www dot shrey dot com. That's www dot s r e i dot com. You like the Founder Thesis podcast? Then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing, technology, career advice, books, and drama. Visit the podium dot in. That is t h e p o d i u n. dot i n for a complete list of all our shows this was an hd smartcast original hd smartcast log on to hdsmartcast.com to listen to more such podcasts